Welcome everyone, I'm, I'm Daniel, uh, part of Arendao, and I have the, the pleasure here to welcome Brian, Brian Robertson, founder of Holacracy One, uh, probably the, the mastermind behind uh, a lot of what's happened over there. Uh, I'm very excited to, to have you here with us. So uh, welcome, Brian, if you'd like to, to share maybe a, a, couple, a couple words about yourself. Yeah. Uh, well, hello. Um, hi, everyone. And thanks for for joining. Uh, this is this is exciting. I, I don't often get to talk about the intersection of these two uh, spheres that are both really really important in my life. Obviously, holacracy, um, but uh, in the crypto world, uh, I've been um, deeply deeply in. Uh, I I got involved in crypto as an investor in 2013. And uh, it just blew me away and, and seemed in so many ways like the, the future of society, the future of, uh, I, th there was so much potential in it. Um, and, you know, I've, I've kind of watched for nine years now and looked at um, where these two have potential intersections. And then as the whole concept of DAOs showed up and then matured up, uh, I started seeing more and more, not just potential, uh, integrations, but where, where each one really, really needed the other for certain applications. And, and, uh, and here we are, and it's the first time I've publicly spoken about this. Um, so that's, that's kind of cool. Um, I'm the founder of Holacracy. I've been involved in the crypto space as an investor for nine years now. And um, here I am. Yeah, that's that, that's that's super exciting and and very much uh, resonates. I'm actually surprised you you haven't spoken about these uh, before in the crypto space longer than than many of the people that call themselves uh, DAO OGs. Mm -hmm. um, to some degree, like even myself, I got involved more around 2017 and so on, and it was this moment where. I, I had been doing sort of self-management organization design for some time and always uh, to some degree struggling to get organizations to either have the funds and the willingness to innovate and try new things and also the technological capabilities to be able to get change and scale. And when I discovered the web free or the, the, the early crypto space, it was like, wow, here is, here is really really, really happening. Uh, but also it's been happening in all kinds of directions and a lot of reinventing the wheel. And, and so I was thinking there is probably a, a lot to learn from self-management methodologies and so on that, that have evolved um, in other places. Um, maybe for, for context, if, if I could ask you a little bit, uh, in case there are some, some folks here who are less familiar with, with Holacracy and so on, could you give us just a quick overview of how, how did it came to be uh, and what does it do? Yeah, totally. So, um, Holacracy came from a lot of experimentation and uh, it started, I ran a software company back in 2001 uh, is really where this, this thing started. And uh, I guess unlike a lot of entrepreneurs, I was not very passionate about what my software company built. <laughs> uh, I was passionate about how we built it. And I just had this burning sense, there's got to be a better way to do this. Uh, and this being run a company. I had been part of traditional organizational structures and they all left me feeling like this is awful. Uh, my background's in software and I, I software architecture and I would architect these beautiful software systems. And then I'd look at the human system around me and say, this thing is designed terribly, right? Like this, 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 uh, th there's so many issues <laughs> and they get in the way of us building beautiful things together. Um, the get in the way also of us relating together and actually being able to be human together and connected. And I mean, so many issues come from the design of our, our organizations today. So I was left with this burning sense, there's got to be a better way. And I didn't know what that was, but I wanted to experiment. So I started my software company as a laboratory. And for years following this, I went out and just experimented. What are new ways of governing and structuring and organizing a business? And I found any idea and technique and anything I could find out in the world, practiced, tried lots of things, and then started pioneering and inventing new processes. And Holacracy was the result of years of experimentation, looking for a new way to build organizations. And uh, with that, I left my software company and started my current business 15 years ago to go take this to the market and spread it and scale it and evolve it, further mature it up. And that company is Holacracy One, 
and it's been doing that work now for 15 years and it's spread all over the, the world. And you can think of Holacracy uh, really simply as a decentralized way to organize uh, a company. So it doesn't use what we're used to, which is a top-down management hierarchy, a command hierarchy. Um, and when I say that, people often get some misunderstandings. People think I'm saying there's no structure, and I'm not. Uh, Holacracy uses more structure, not less than a management hierarchy. When you don't have a simple top-down command hierarchy, you need more clarity, not less, uh, of how things are going to work around here to avoid all sorts of problems. So Holacracy is a highly structured system, but a decentralized structure. People often uh, also get the uh, wrong idea that uh, without a top-down management hierarchy, decisions must be made by large groups uh, coming together with big meetings and lots of consensus. And it's actually the opposite. Holacracy is more autocratic than a management hierarchy. It's just a decentralized autocracy. So it breaks up who makes which decisions. Um, and if you're in a company using Holacracy, you know this is my decision-making area, my role. It's a role-based system, breaks up work into roles. And you know these are my roles and my role is to lead and you know the bounds of your decision making power within that role and you know the limits because if you don't know your limits you don't know your power so you also know the limits of your decision making freedom you know where you don't have authority to make a decision in your role or where you do have to integrate with somebody else or where you do have to follow something that somebody else decides right and when all of that is clear we then empower everyone in the system to really lead their piece in connection with everyone else and what we have wrapping around that is a meta structure uh, or a meta process that's used to evolve all of those rules, all of those roles, right? So we have a meta process that lets us update, well, what is your role and what are we going to expect from your role and what decision-making authority does your role have and what responsibilities go with that and what limits go with that, right? That that's constantly evolving in a company running with Holacracy. We're constantly learning and evolving the structure of how work gets done in this organization. So it's a living structure. Um, and all of that is done without a traditional top-down management hierarchy, but a set of processes, a meta process for evolving everything else uh, distributed throughout the organization and then clear roles that have clear power and clear limits distributed throughout the organization. So that's the very short whirlwind tour and how that works and gets there is a whole nother conversation, but that's in a nutshell what Holacracy is. It's a decentralized way to run an organization. Fantastic. I, I find this idea of the decentralized autocracy fascinating, uh, mostly because DAOs have taken somewhat accidentally, uh, to some degree, an, the opposite design route. Like in, in DAOs at the beginning, the, the easiest thing to create, like the most basic infrastructure was let's, let's create a thing that can hold tokens, like a treasury, and then some way to make decisions about that, which end up being a voting tool, like majority voting tool, and everyone who has the token can vote. So direct democracy sort of process. And, and that obviously works well in some applications. It doesn't work well in other applications. Um, but I know you've been doing uh, some thinking about like, what are the things that the DAOs do well? And well, for me, they enable transparency. Uh, they have been very, very good at in general, the culture that's been created around it, around decentralization of power and so on, that sort of protects the organization from power grabs to some degree. Obviously, there is a lot, there is all kind of things in the ecosystem and a, 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 as well a lot of scams and things like that. Um, but the, the transparency and the ability to eliminate the need for intermediaries doing basic operations that would require trust seems to be a fantastic feature. I don't know if there is other things uh, there that you would add to this list. Yeah, so I think many things you, you name about DAOs are both their strengths and their limits and their, their weakness, right? Like many decisions are not best made by a vote of token holders, right? Democracy is a terrible way to make many, many, yeah. many decisions. <laughs> um, and, and, and yet it's a great way to make certain decisions, right? Like, and, and that uh, is where we get the, the limits, I think, of a pure DAO. And this was immediately obvious to me in the early uh, movement as, as DAOs start, started showing up. There are certain things they're just great at, um, you know. And I, I'm an investor in the DeFi space since the beginning of that, and that's you know lots and lots of DAOs out there. Um, and uh, there there are some parts of that that just make so much sense when it's a relatively simple system that is best governed with some kind of wisdom of the crowd. And yet, there's a lot of things that need 
an in, more individual decision making to lead effectively in an organization. Um, there's uh, and and DAOs don't they don't have a mechanism for that. They don't handle that well. Um, so they're they're limited to fairly simple problem sets or fairly mathematical problem sets, right? Like there's a reason why they're great for DeFi. There's there's a largely mathematical problem set there, and what parameters or variables we do need to configure work really well doing so with some kind of vote of the token holders. Uh, but they don't work as well for certain uh, types of innovation or certain decisions that just need to be made by more individual depth of judgment. If if it takes a lot of research to make a decision then maybe a vote of a lot of token holders that are only so interested is not the best best path, right? If somebody needs to, to go deep to make a decision and lead it, or not just make one decision, but have a whole strategy uh, enacted, right? Then, then sometimes a vote of token holders is possibly not the best, best idea. So you end up with this, uh, like anything, whatever design decisions you make often become both strengths and weaknesses, right? So, uh, like oh, go ahead. So sorry, sorry, I'm interrupting you, but let me dig a dig a little bit there because I I think you're you're really getting at the crux of an issue that is that has been constantly on the mind uh, in the conversations in the in the DAO space and and also is an issue from the self management or progressive organization world uh, that always comes a lot. That is this idea of the strategy and and so in the at least from memory in the the sort of system design of holacracy, you have the two main types of meetings. You have the governance meetings where you're changing the roles and you have the sort of coordination meetings where you're coordinating tasks essentially. And strategy as I understand is usually left as something that perhaps a role can, can treat it and, and so on. But at least to my understanding, and obviously it's a very limited understanding, uh, hence the idea to, to kind of like make a, a small pause here to, to dig into this idea of, of strategy in, in holacracy, uh, and especially with, with your rich experience having seen holacracy across so many different organizations. Could you tell us a little bit more about how that strategy process works or this idea of like, of what does a strategy mean in a, in a holacracy context? Yeah, so, you know, the word strategy is one of those, like, um, it, it means a lot of different things to a lot of different people in business. And so we have to be careful with terms that overloaded. Uh, same thing with leadership. That's a, one of these great ones that, like, we throw around all the time, but what the hell does that mean? Um, the, the one thing I can say about both these, these concepts, strategy and leadership, in most conventional organizational thought, we tend to think of that as something very big that comes, you know, uh, uh, it, it's the big thing, the really important thing that comes from the top if we're in a conventional organizational structure. And I think it's more powerful to think of these as things that need to be infused throughout the system, right? Every role needs strategy. I mean, even if you've got a role to mop the floors, well, there are different strategies you can take to mop the floors and some are going to be more effective than others, right? And, and maybe the guy in charge of mopping the floors should have something to do with the strategy for mopping the floors, right? Um, Maybe that person would have some interesting input there, you know? Uh, the same could be said for leadership. Every role requires leadership. Again, even the guy mopping the floors needs to lead that role, needs to make some decisions, needs to have some autonomy and use, execute some, some ownership over that, that work. So I, I think this is one of the things that Holacracy does incredibly well. It, it distributes and infuses strategy and leadership throughout the system. Now, some strategic decisions are going to be really big. Like we might need to decide what new market do we get into for, I, I run a company that does a lot of training and consulting around Holacracy. Well, when do we go into a completely new part of the world and bring Holacracy there? That's a big strategic decision, right? So there's, there's different decisions like that that need a, a strategic frame for them and then need leadership. So which of these strategies is useful to involve multiple people in coming up with um, and which are not? You know, I, I kind of don't want multiple people to be involved in the strategy of how we mop the floors. Um, it's just not worth it. I kind of don't want to put a vote to our token holders, right, of, of how we do that. Or I don't want our office manager to put a vote to the token holders. What kind of pens should we get for the office, right? Like there's certain decisions that are just not worth it. <laughs> uh, and then there are others that are so complex that a, a democratic decision making is probably not the right one, where, where the, the right answer to the decision needs to be a depth of research, in which case you might want multiple people involved, but not actually having decision making rights. 
right? You might want lots of input. If I'm deciding what new market to open for our business, it's useful to get a lot of input from a lot of people, but that's probably not the best decision to make democratically, right? It, it takes a depth of really getting into it and then owning and leading in a follow through uh, or, or following through with the decision as well. I don't want that to be made via a vote of mostly disinterested parties who are not um, not even necessarily representing the organization's interests. This is another, another challenge you have with pure token holders. Everyone is at that point representing their own economic interests, at least to some degree, if not to a large degree, right? Um, whereas in a conventional organization, at least you have this, this kind of boundary where people are theoretically representing the organization's interests. And of course, that doesn't always work that way either, right? <laughs> um, but actually, I think it's easier to control than a pure vote of token holders. And yet there are downsides of running a company with a conventional top-down management hierarchy. So what I'm trying to point to here is I think a lot of the, the limits where, where I'm seeing the pure DAO model as um, missing something that's needed in certain contexts or cases, not to knock it. It's brilliant and it's enabled completely new things and it enables things that Holacracy doesn't um, and yeah. vice versa. So we have a, we have a clarifying question uh, here. Well, a, a question from Mili that I, I think gives us an, an excellent uh, continuation to what you're saying. So we have in, in DAOs and especially the early DAOs that are anonymous or pseudonymous and you have these whole bunch of people who have bot tokens, uh, but you don't really know who they are. You don't really know what they care about. You've never met them. You don't know how involved they are. You don't even know if they're gonna be involved or not. And one of the issues that DAOs have suffered from is lack of participation in, in decisions, which makes sense when you're like, if you have only a handful of tokens, it's just not worth it for you to participate in a decision that other people can do. You have a free rider problem or anyway, or, or lack of sufficient incentives, or you just don't have the context to make these things. And, and in Holacracy, uh, you have a very, very different setup, right? Like where the, the roles and the responsibility to make which decision is, is very, very, very clearly attributed. And so Mili is asking, who decides which role fit each participant? Um, yeah. So yeah. So uh, one one thing I'd like to say, uh, just for framing, as I before I answer this, uh, so I, I've led organizations for um, more than two decades now, and one of the things I've noticed as I've led different companies, I'm I'm an entrepreneur, a founder of multiple organizations now, and what I've noticed again and again is there are very very few decisions that actually make sense to make via any kind of voting mechanism democratic decision-making, there's a, a very thin problem set that it, it actually is the best decision-making tool for in an organizational context. So with that said, <laughs> this is one of those cases, <laughs> uh, who decides which role people should fill? I, I actually tried, um, oh God, 20 some years ago, uh, one of the experiments I ran was, what if we use a democratic decision-making mechanism for deciding who fills which role? And it was a total disaster. <laughs> Um, it was a terrible idea. Um, I don't think that's a decision that's typically uh, well made for, uh, for a democratic decision. And I should say, caveat that with most roles, there are some roles that do seem to work really well that way. Um, so it has something to do with the nature of the work or the role. But for most roles that require any kind of specialized expertise, you don't want that, right? That the average person, like think of the average token holder in a DAO, they don't know the expertise required of most roles, and they certainly don't know the people, the candidates, well enough to know who has that expertise. It would be a terrible idea to put to a vote of the token holders who fills certain roles, because you're not going to decide that based on skill at that point. You're going to decide that based on something very different. And if the role is a high skill required role, you have an issue, you have a mismatch. Now, if what you're trying to decide for, if the key to that role's success is not skill, if it's you know somebody that people generally trust, right? Then it might actually be an okay decision-making mechanism. But if the role requires skill, democratic vote, especially among less interested parties that have less not domain knowledge, is a terrible decision uh, decision-making mechanism. So what Holacracy has is a couple things. It has a default, and it has a way to change that default. By default, there is a role on each team that has that decision-making authority. So that role doesn't have the authority to command anyone else or to make a decision for anyone else's role, but it is basically a talent scout for the team. They have the, uh, a few delineated, limited decision-making powers. One of them is assigning other people to roles, 
right? That's the default in Holacracy, right? So there is a, a role that has that, that power, but that default can be changed. So if you have a different way to do it or a better way to do it in this, this context or a constraint you want to add onto that default, you can do that through the meta governance process that Holacracy adds. Um, and we find that, that kind of autocratic decision-making for most roles gets you much better role fits. And not always, which is why you can change any of it. Hmm. Thank you. That's, uh, I, I think that provides a lot of clarity to some of the questions that were surfacing yeah. there, uh, as well as so like Robin asking about the specific limits uh, of DAOs not, not working well. Like, and for example, site one recently where there was uh, a person, one of the leaders of uh, one of the most famous protocols, ENS, Ethereum Name Service Protocol, that put it on Twitter, something that many people will have considered hate speech. And there was an election of whether they, they should remain in the role or, or not. Uh, and of course, this is a role that's based around representing the general will of the, of the token holders, not a, not a specialized role. Uh, but DAOs have generally tended to use a very blunt mechanism. Um, yeah, so, and, and I, there's something here I wanna point out. I, I see Millie's comment that it seems very centralized and it is. It's one type of decision that's centralized. And one of the things you'll notice about Holacracy is most decisions are centralized in a decentralized way. In other words, this is the decentralized autocracy I mentioned. Most decisions are made by one person, but it's a different person for different decisions, right? Like one person's gonna decide who fills what roles and have a lot of autocratic power in that. But another person is gonna decide what new markets do we enter for our trainings and have a lot of autocratic power within delineated limits for that. Another role is going to decide what venue do we use for our training. Another role is going to decide what content do we put in our training. Each of these is a centralized decision, but they're each made by a different person leading different roles. So it's a decentralized, centralized authority structure. And the other thing I, I want to add here is the goal of Holacracy is not to be decentralized. And I think this is really important. It's a means to an end. The goal of Holacracy is to best serve the purpose of an organization. That's absolutely key. If the best way to serve that purpose is to centralize every decision in one person, in one role, let's create a role. Let's call it the CEO role. And let's give the CEO role the power to decide anything in the entire organization. If that's really the best way to serve the purpose, great, do it. Create that role. If you want to create a subordinate role and give the CEO role the authority to boss around the subordinate and the subordinate, the expectation to do anything the CEO says, you could create that in Holacracy. It just rarely makes sense. That's rarely the best way to express a purpose. It makes much more sense to break things down and delineate and divide out power. But the goal of Holacracy is not just decentralization for decentralization's sake. The goal of Holacracy is how do we best organize around the purpose? And it supports decentralization as a means to an end because that's usually a better mechanism, but not always. One of the, one of the things that struck me the most when, when I was learning about Holacracy and the time I spent working in organizations using Holacracy as an, a sort of operating system. And, and this is in, in some ways a parallel to DAOs, but that was the tremendous mindset shift from, and, and, and as myself as someone who is used to doing like system design and organization design, and you make these macro decisions and try to figure out all of these details very top down, which was kind of like the original approach. The, the, the biggest mindset shift was when you start to distribute this authority is sort of making one decision and almost not thinking about the consequences too much, but rather just putting your processing your attention, the thing that you need, putting it out there and then letting the system react to it and adapt. And, 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 yeah. and I, I seen the, somewhat a similar challenge when people try to join DAOs or especially the leader is like, no, I have my vision and so on, and I want to control it. And, and I need to know all the details instead of like, how can I let or create the system that can adapt and, and, and almost like invent its own path, its own structure as it goes along to, to service the, the collective purpose that, that we have. Yeah, totally. The, 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 this is one of the huge paradigm shifts that takes people a while to get used to when they enter a company running with Holacracy or they adopt this in their organization. Uh, we're used to trying to often kind of get the right design up front. 
And holacracy shifts us to instead an evolutionary design mechanism where the goal is not to get everything right up front. There's maybe a very small set of, of things we do need to get right up front. Great, get those right up front. But that's a tiny percentage in most organizations. Most things we can trust our ability to evolve towards as long as we have an evolutionary process to get there. So that shifts the frame to just let's experiment and adapt and increment, incrementally iterate until we get to the right design. So for example, we were working with one organization, a smaller company, um, and when they first brought in Holacracy, we, the first thing we do is just map their existing power structure into this new language of Holacracy and then let them start evolving it. We don't try to solve it and decentralize it all up front. So for example, in this company, we asked, how do people get fired in this company? And the answer was the CEO fires them, right? It's autocratic decision-making on this, this founder's part. So we said, okay, great. Well, there's no CEO anymore. We're just, that's gone. There's no management hierarchy. So let's create a role for that. And they named the role, um, they named the role, uh, what was it? The executioner. And they gave the executioner role, the autocratic authority to fire anyone in the company with no bounds, no limits, just because, which is, is how they've been operating before. I don't think that's a great way to fire people, but that's how they've been operating before. So we mapped it. And then we said, notice what tensions come up for you in your roles. And there was another role that was in charge of something around the organization's culture that brought up attention and said, you know, it's actually kind of scaring people that one person has this autocratic authority with no due process to fire anyone. So maybe we should limit that. And then they started processing tensions and proposing changes and the structure and process evolved. And before long, they had a completely different way of firing people that involved multiple parties involved in the decision-making and a due process for making the decision, right? So this to me is the beauty of Holacracy. It's not that it gives you the one right way to fire people up front. It's not that it gives you a perfect decentralized firing process up front. It's that it maps where you are and it lets the processes evolve so they're getting better and better and better over time. Right? And that's why I can genuinely tell you in my company, I love how we fire people. It's a really cool decentralized process. I wrote a blog post on it. If you want to go into the details, check my blog. Um, but it, it's really cool. And it, it's not there because Holacracy gave us the one right answer to that up front. It's there because we spent years processing tensions and improving our processes as they got better and better and better for our purpose. So this is what I mean by an evolutionary design process. And this is also something that a lot of DAOs lack in that they have some structure for it. You can propose certain governance changes, but that's not the best process for a micro evolution of a lot of micro processes. It's, it's great for certain big decisions, right? Putting a vote to your token holders is a heavyweight thing. There, there's a whole process to that. Whereas some of these processes, you just want a micro tweak to iterate on and evolve. And DAOs don't necessarily lend themselves well to that specific process. They do really well at other things, better than Holacracy does, when you need a community of stakeholders in certain decisions. Holacracy doesn't have built-in mechanisms that make that really efficient and easy. So I can also get into the other side. There's a lot that DAOs bring that Holacracy doesn't. But I think the really interesting question is how do you integrate the two, which is something that uh, um, I've been working on a lot lately. Yeah, fantastic. And, and I'm seeing so many questions in the in the chat that are super curious about uh, how bringing the two together. And, if, and I would love to go there, but just before before we do, uh, to reference uh, a couple of points that were happening earlier. So there was, Andrea was asking about what makes uh, protocol DAOs succeed so well, just so we touch a little bit on the other side. You were saying that this ability to get uh, a broader set of stakeholders to actually to actually have input these is perhaps the the point that I I would really 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 highlight there. I don't know if there is something else perhaps that you would say that DAOs are particularly good at uh, that we can bring into the conversation. Um, I think that's just a great example of most of the problem sets that you have for at least certain protocol DAOs, like basic financial protocols, like in the DeFi space, for example, are just really well fit for the DAO model. Although I do think there are some decisions that are kind of kludged in there that don't always fit great in that model, but for the most part they do, and they work really well for that problem set. Um, and you need a certain community trust for people to build on top of a protocol and lock money in a protocol. So that there's a lot they offer in terms of base safety and trust for a mostly mathematical problem set that has certain key variables that need to evolve with community involvement. 
they're, they're really good fits for that problem set. Yeah, seems like sometimes I imagine them as the the ultimate the ultimate backstop is that community. If the if the purpose of the organization is to serve his his broader set of stakeholders at the end, more than any temporary definition that we might have, and obviously the temporary definition is is useful, like a mission statement or someone can be useful for people to grasp the idea to create alignment. But at the end, what if we what we want is serve this community of stakeholders, the DAO mechanism is is relatively well geared to do that and well there is different other things that were mentioned there like uh, quadratic voting and so on that reduces the influence that someone who has a lot a lot of tokens can have and sort of mediating between the cooperative one person one vote and the shareholder way one share one vote and kind of slice it in the middle in a in a more elegant way and anyway there is a lot of of mechanisms um that we can have there uh but Coming back a little bit to the to the holacracy side, and maybe with these we can start to make some inroads into what you were saying about integrating the two and the the thinking that that you have had there. Um, there was Milik who was mentioning about what's good for for fifty members and the mechanisms that uh, can be very very different for five hundred thousand members. And and I wanted to to highlight perhaps a couple of principles. Is the well the beautiful emergent emergent nature of having a, f a set of rules that then allow to for order to be created and evolve and constantly evolve on top that both the idea of the DAO governance and, and holacracy allowed uh, but where holacracy seems to be a lot way further ahead of the game in refining that thinking that DAOs are only starting to explore with the idea perhaps of sub DAOs or is this fractal sort of uh, sort of a structure so perhaps you can tell us a little bit about that and then we go fully into the the question of how do we yeah. bring these things together? This is another limit I see with a lot of DAOs currently, although, I, like you said, I, I think there are solutions to this. The DAO space just hasn't fully explored yet. Um, and, and that's possibly because it's not actually the right base structure in order to go fractal. But yeah, Holacracy uses a fractal structure. So uh, this meta governance process that I'm mentioning, it's not a flat process that's used for the entire organization, one governance process. Uh, it, it's every team is governing itself. It's governing its own micro processes, its own micro policies for the work of that team within a boundary. And then that team becomes a part of a larger team, which is doing the same thing with representatives of each of the sub teams, right? So there's, there's a, a fractal nature to the structure, which makes it very, very scalable. Um, and the largest we've seen uh, an entire organization doing Holacracy, there's a few organizations out there that are around 2000 employees doing Holacracy across the entire company. But there are also organizations that are hundreds of thousands of employees doing Holacracy in one department. They just haven't scaled that to the whole company and the broader company is not interested at this point in those, those settings. Um, and it scales beautifully to 2000. There's no, no limit there. There's not even any downsides, I think at that point other than it's harder to adopt because you've got 2,000 people to train and, and shift their habits and all that. But aside from the adoption challenge to shift from one paradigm to another paradigm, the structure itself scales beautifully. It's a fractal structure. Of course it does. Um, just like nature, right? Look at the human body, trillions of cells operating together and there's no CEO cell and no command hierarchy telling the others what to do. But that also is a fractal structure, right? That the, the cells are grouped together in organs. And the organ doesn't violate the autonomy of the cells, it builds on top of it, right? The heart's job is not to micromanage, it's to take the muscle cells and the nerve cells and the blood cells and build on their, their autonomous functioning, a larger, higher level function, a more abstract function, which is itself just part of a larger system, a cardiovascular system, which adds to the component parts, a more abstract or higher level function. And that's how Holacracy structures an organization as well. Um, and in doing that, it gives each of the entities at any level of scale a governance process for that level of scale and a way to connect it into a broader governance pro practice of something larger, right? So Holacracy does that really, really well. And um, it has nothing to say about how to get community involvement, which is, uh, and there are some ways that you can do that in Holacracy in the same way that you can kind of subdivide DAOs, but that's not its, its best fit. And I think DAOs have a much more evolved mechanism for how to get a larger community involved. And this is where we're now getting to the intersection. Um, so back to you and then I'll take it whenever you want me to. <laughs> no, thanks. Yeah, so um, I'm actually gonna take it to uh, another question from uh, the industry and please forgive me if I mispronounce your name, uh, but I would under try to attempt to do so as uh, Elijah. 
perhaps, uh, please correct me if I'm wrong, um, but they are asking, we're talking about ownership in the sense of tasks and responsibilities. And in the, in the DAO space, ownership is usually, and, and, and again, ownership is a very, uh, I'm here, I'm hijacking the comment a little bit, but uh, ownership is a very abstract concept. Uh, is this sort of fiction that we have created? It, it, it relates to control. It relates to the right to you to leverage the benefits or usage of the thing and so on. But uh, but in DAOs, that's generally sort of compressed on this idea of the token that is a unit of value that you can trade and allows you to make governance. And sometimes, if it's a utility token, you can then use that token uh, to get the the usage, the benefit of whatever the protocol does for you. Uh, now, in in, hol in holocracy, the, the because it's more rooted in, or it started at least in the more traditional world where the legal structure was defining the ownership. And uh, please correct me if I'm wrong, but holocracy ends up being somewhat of a neutral system, independent of the ownership structure. Uh, but there was this sort of, let's say, uh, what what in uh, web free terminology people love to call like a, a, a single point of failure or central point. That is, at the end this authority in traditional legal structure is usually delegated by a board or to a CEO. And then this person needs to re-delegate re this, this thing. Uh, but there is such a, the idea of signing the, the holocracy constitution. So maybe you can tell us a little bit about the concept of, of ownership uh, in holocracy or other things I might have not covered in, in this uh, direction. Yeah, so holacracy is intentionally silent on that, uh, or another way of saying it, compatible with whatever ownership structure you want to plug into it. Um, and that's very intentional. It's, it's holacracy is a, a, it's not solving that problem set. It's trying to figure out how do you break down work and organize around expressing a purpose. Separately, what do you do with the proceeds of what you generate along the way? Um, that's a different question and, and holacracy is compatible with any possible answer. You can run holacracy in an organization where all ownership, all equity is centralized in a single person, or you could own it in which everyone has an exact equal share in it, or in which the community owns it, or anything in between. Um, that said, I, I can tell you that um, I personally find it really useful when equity is more distributed, more decentralized, um, but not entirely so. There is also a value in being able to have an investor, somebody that generates, provides initial capital and gets a chunk of equity, just like in the crypto space, you, you know, people invest, they get a chunk back for that. And that, that gives you initial capital that you often need to build out a project. So anything is possible. And it's a question of which one is the best fit for purpose. And I'd say something in between um, where you have as broad equity ownership as possible, but still allow room for investment when you need capital to launch something uh, tends to be really useful. Yeah, there to uh kudos to Elida to first suggest this idea of cooperatives uh we're starting to get involved in in some some research around sub -dial governance and as well thinking about multi-stakeholder voting and the fair share models which evolved from cooperatives but brian i see you're uh yeah. you're dying to make a point please go ahead yeah yeah I, I forgot to mention there's also some interesting things you can do with legal structure uh one of the things that i pioneered uh, many years ago using holacracy was a a new legal structure um, it's, uh, we had a team of attorneys and tax accountants working on this, but uh, there's a, a, some pretty novel legal structures you can do to embed holacracy style governance in the legal foundation. So it is enforceable in court if it needs to be, which is an interesting model. Now, instead of just relying on code as law, which has its place, like there's you know, areas where that makes a ton of sense, but there's also areas where subjective human interpretation of things and more nuanced governance structures is also really useful. And it sure is nice to be able to rely on our broader legal frames that we've created as a, a human society when you need to, without just falling back to overly simplistic models um, like we're used to in a typical corporate structure. So we have a, a pretty interesting novel legal structure um, in my company, for example, that we use where we legally have no employees. Um, we have all K-1 business partners. They get a K-1, same statement that a partner in a law firm would get. There's a, a very different legal structure that dodges all employment law and all the crap that comes with that and is enforceable in court if it needs, needs to be. So not everyone, uh, of course, is going to use those legal structures that does holacracies. Oh. Some people, that's way over their risk threshold if they're a more conventional organization. <laughs> but it is possible. And there's yeah, some really I'm interesting sorry. things you can do when you have this kind of uh, governance structure uh, at the legal level. 
Yeah, it's a, it's a fascinating rabbit hole. It's also been such a huge problem problem area in, in, in DAOs. Also, I think that perhaps digging a little bit deeper down that rabbit hole will, will take us somewhat outside of the conversation. Yeah. But uh, Brian, just as kind of like a top line comment for those who want to dig deeper into that, where can we learn more about uh, these different uh, holacracy legal structures? That you uh, if you look at my with? blog, um, there's something, I forget what it's called. I think it's something around distributed property rights and organization or something. Search my blog, you'll find it. If not, send us a message at holacracy.org. Tell us what you're looking for and somebody will point you to the, the right blog post. Sure, fantastic. So let's, uh, let's dig into it. So we, I, I guess we've been tiptoeing around, around the question of DAOs and, and holacracy uh, quite a bit, but um, I'm curious what sort of uh, ideas or, or thoughts have you been uh, coming up with related to this. Yeah, so let me just use a, a concrete example to illustrate a lot of it uh, with a, a real issue we're tackling right now in my company. Uh, we're working on evolving our licensing program. So we have um, uh, core IP, we have the Holacracy brand itself, we have materials built around that. And right now we maintain this licensing program where we do some quality control checks for any consultant that wants to go sell Holacracy consulting services uh, or trainings or whatever and make money doing, doing that. So we have a trademark in there and we have some, some basic uh, materials that are useful to them, sample processes, contracts, handouts, training slides, things like that. So this licensing model is uh, right now fairly conventional. People sign up for a license. Uh, we do some quality control checks. They have to get certain certifications in order to prove that they have the competency to do this and represent this, this well in the world so that the broader market can trust. If somebody says I'm a certified Holacracy coach, they've gone through some basic quality control checks. And then that person can go out and, and represent the brand and sell services and things like that using the materials we provide and all that. And we wanna evolve this. Uh, the problem is this is still, uh, Holacracy itself is kind of centralized ownership in my company, Holacracy One. So what we're doing is creating a foundation that's gonna hold this core IP um, and provide some of the functions, provide the certification function with the assessments involved in that, provide the licensing function. Um, it's going to uh, have some basic marketing functions of, of spreading Holacracy and helping uh, the world understand what it is. So we're, we're taking a core piece of what we're doing and putting it into this foundation. And we want this foundation to have community ownership and, and community control as much as possible. But there's still functions here that don't lend themselves well to democratic decision making. As I said, very few decisions in most organizations lend themselves well to democratic decision making, um, especially among largely disinterested parties that aren't deeply involved in the work. That's even even harder. So what we're doing is creating this DAO holacracy hybrid, where this foundation will be legally governed with holacracy. So it's it's going to have a legal Constant, Holacracy is a constitution driven system. So there's a written, it's an open source constitution. It's used, it's the same generic one. It's a meta process. It's used by thousands of companies now. So this foundation will have that constitution, Holacracy constitution at its core governance structure legally. But now we're integrating some concepts of DAO. So there'll be a token and this token will be um, required for anyone that wants to license Holacracy. So you'll need to Whole, we're still working out the token token mechanics and all this, but uh, for example, this isn't, don't take this as the exact mechanism we're gonna use, but just as an example, somebody who wants to license Holacracy may need to uh, acquire and lock up a certain number of these tokens to get their license. And then these tokens can provide certain DAO-like functions. Uh, so there will be certain decisions that need to go to a vote of the broader licensee community that are holding these tokens. For example, um, we have quality standards, like quality control standards that, that you have to meet if you're using the brand. Um, those are mostly impacting the broader network of people doing holacracy consulting or training work in the world. So if we're gonna add a new quality standard, that might be something that needs to be ratified by the broader token holders, right? So there'll be certain things that are defined in the holacracy governance process as being required of the broader token holders, uh, votes of the broader token holders. So we have this interesting hybrid where the local holacracy governance process, which is by default, holacracy governance is the people doing the work are governing that work, right? So the people doing the work through that governance can define certain things that need to get ratified by the broader community. 
that broader community is going to want some involvement in that local governance process. So one of the things they can do, for example, is appoint a representative or two or whatever into something more like a board, right? Uh, but in this case, it's our governance process of this, this entity. So our broader licensees or token holders can identify somebody to be part of the micro governance, the holacracy style governance, governing all the specific little things going on in this organization. And we can go further, further still with this. Uh, so right now, uh, when I, I look at DAOs, I see solutions proposed, right, that are then voted on by the token holders. But one of the powerful things about holacracy is the focus is on not just the solution, but the tension. Before you get to the solution, you have a tension. Something is not working as well as you envision, right? You're feeling a tension. You might have a solution in mind, but that solution need integration with others. It might, might be that you're optimizing part of the system and sub-optimizing another part, which is the problem often with first solutions that somebody comes up with. They're often optimizing for one problem and sub-optimizing something else. Holacracy's governance process is beautiful at finding an integration so you don't sub-optimize something else. So... Imagine one of the token holders, who's probably a licensee doing holacracy work in the world, they have a tension. They might have a solution in mind, but the tension is, is primary. There's something not working in the current standards or processes of this foundation, right? The quality control standards or something, the assessment, the certification process, whatever it is. So instead of just proposing a solution to a vote, what they do with the tension is get enough other token holders to say, I share the tension, right? Whatever the solution is, that tension is limiting me and my company as well. And then that you get enough threshold, whatever that threshold is of people sharing the tension. And now the person that started that can be invited into the holacracy style governance process of the entity with the tension without having to have a specific solution because that holacracy style governance process is really good at coming up with a solution from attention that doesn't suboptimize another part of the organization, right? So you've now got a mechanism to come in with just attention and then use a micro governance process, which is more using human judgment, allowing dialogue, allowing integration of different pieces to come up with a solution. And then that person can go back to the normal life after they've processed that tension or solved that tension. This is just a handful of examples. There's a lot of them. We can use the token holders for appointing certain roles. Again, some roles don't make sense, some roles not. But for example, the one role I mentioned that is choosing who's a good fit for other roles, maybe that role gets appointed by something going to the token holders, or maybe not. But we can evolve that through the evolutionary process. So through this, we've got this interesting model that's combining, I think, some of what DAOs do really well with integrating community and allowing the community to come in and solve and process local tensions in the organization. Uh, and we're combining that, what DAOs do well, with that, that piece Holacracy does well, of a, a, a governance process using human judgment and integration among the people actually doing the work and using that to break out authority and allow people to still go and lead, right? Somebody still needs to make day-to-day -day marketing decisions for how to share Holacracy. We don't want every little day-to-day -day marketing decision going to a vote of the token holders. We want some governance framework put in place to empower somebody to go lead that role within certain bounds. And that's what the DAO process can get involved in in saying, hey, we need a role that's doing marketing here. And here are some limits for that role. Here are some bounds for that role. Here are the expectations of that role. And now let's empower somebody to go lead that role. And when our token holders need to come in and add a new standard or constraint for our marketing person, they can do that. They have a mechanism to do that. So we're now starting to blend the, I think, the best of what DAOs can do and what Holacracy can do in this hybrid model. Um, so anyway, that's a lot, but that's the, the high level. <laughs> I'm pretty excited about it. We're working towards this right now. And I think the model applies for far more than just a licensing program in our specific example. Yeah, I mean, if something is clear is that this topic is huge and, and we could be talking about this for a very, very, very long time uh, as there is so much there is so much to unpack. And and so perhaps let me let me take it in the we have roughly five minutes left and I'm going to take it to 
to one curiosity is uh, the system in general is uh, self-evolving, self-transforming and so on. And given enough time and conditions and so on, it will hopefully get to a good place. Like if the rate of change is fast enough, the rate of adaptation is fast enough, it will adapt to its environment, to its needs. Now, the, the other challenge is, well, you have this structure essentially that the work or is happening and so on and the people are organizing. You have the rules that are enabling the self-organization to happen. And, and holacracy constitution is kind of like this set of rules, at least for, for holacracy or in DAOs, it can be the, the governance charter or, or the smart contracts that have uh, those rules sort of embedded into them. And, and in, in the sense of how do we start to create this set of rules? Uh, for me, it struck me, again, years ago, when I got you know, first in contact with uh, Holacracy, one of the things that struck me was that, at least at the time, uh, it was this idea of you need to implement all of these rules uh, because, like, and, and, and as a sort of, like, a governance system thinker person, it's so easy to fall in love with the precision of the rules. And we've gone through through hell to to refine a certain process and so on it's like no but there is so much knowledge and wisdom embedded in this like a small tweak here and so on and and i could really sense that in that it was this sort of cohesive system that had a lot of thought embedded into it uh, but then in the implementation sometimes it was the challenge of like it's a lot to take in and and there was the metaphor of like the playing football that was used at the time is you just jump in, try to play by the rules. At the beginning, you're maybe going to break the rules and you're going to get some feedback of like, hey, you're breaking some rules, but try to play by the full set of rules. And, and that made a lot of sense in, in theory in my head, but then in the practice, it was really, really hard with organizations. And I have experienced the same thing in, in DAO sometimes of like, how many rules do you put there at, with R and DAO itself? At some point we're, let's design this huge governance structure. We have so many ideas, we can make it amazing because we have so much experience. And they was like, wait a second, let's just use a super simple process to evolve it from there. But I, I know your, your thinking has kind of evolved in, in this direction and, and this is in something, um, what can you tell us on this space? Yeah, so um, this is, uh, I think probably the biggest real reasonable uh, concern that we've heard earlier about adopting holacracy. Uh, the earlier version of holacracy, so holacracy is a constitutional rule set and it is version controlled. We just released version 5.0 recently. Before that, 4.1 was the leading version. So it's it's like an operating system for an organization, an open source operating system that evolves and it's 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 a code. It's a it's a in this case, it's more of a legal code, a constitutional code for how the organization functions. And it's hard to take half of the code base, right? Like this was the, the concern. If you just take a chunk of rules and not other rules. If they're all intermingled, you've got a problem, right? You're, you're, you're at risk of having a set of rules that doesn't actually make any sense if you don't have these other rules to go with it. But that meant you had to adopt holacracy by adopting all of the rules, the entire constitution all at once. And it was a massive change and that made it very difficult. Very reasonable objection, but we solved that with version 5.0. What we did was reorganize the constitution into five articles, which were independent of each other. Um, except for Article 1, which just gives you a baseline. Article 1 is a foundation, and the other four articles can be plugged on top of that in any order, to any degree, and each one stands alone. Which means now you have an incremental path to adopting holacracy, or even a, to adopting a partial version of that, and then forking it and building something on your own if you want. So now, if an organization wants to adopt this, they can start with just adopt Article 1 of the Constitution. And if you do that, you still have mostly whatever you came from, a management hierarchy or whatever it was before, but you have a language for defining roles, you have certain key rules, and then you can start adding the other articles on top of that in due course, in time, and then get used to one article and then add another. And this gives you an incremental pass. So it's no longer true that you have to adopt it all at once, right? You can now actually take an incremental path and learn as you go, which ironically is one of the core things of holacracy is don't try to do everything in giant changes up front, right? Like let it evolve, start where the tension is and evolve over time. And now the very adoption of the system itself actually allows that, um, which I think is, is really, really cool and is probably the biggest innovation in version 5.0 of holacracy, although there's a good hundred others, but that one, that one's the one I'm most excited about because it changes the game and how people can adopt this. Yeah, it's super interesting to see how it starts as uh, well, 
progressively built, probably adding rule by rule as, as there is learning and experience, and then uh, at some point becoming this monolithic system that is now turned into module, uh, a modular set uh, that can be plug and play in different ways and enable or all sorts of different paths uh, and, and use cases. Uh, su super interesting as, you know, as well in, in DAOs, the, the sort of philosophy around the design of smart contracts is following a similar approach of trying to yeah. become very modular and so on. And well, there is, a, there is definitely a, a lot more we could, we could say. Unfortunately, we, we are over time. Um, I'm dropping on the, on the chat uh, a link to, uh, to a document. At the bottom of this document, you can find how to join the Arendao Discord server. This conversation will continue there, especially in the, in the learning and discussion channel. Uh, Brian, if I can convince you, but this is completely up to you, if I can convince you to go and check it out at some point, that would be fantastic. Totally and, right, yeah, and thank you. Yeah, thank you all so much. Uh, Brian, I don't know if you have any, any closing thoughts. Um, um, yeah, if you're interested in following along our process of launching this DAO Holacracy hybrid, um, you can find more about Holacracy on our website. If you join our mailing list, we will definitely be announcing this once we have something there that is is uh, ready to share. And this is kind of the first place we've publicly spoken about this, but more to follow. So um, you can follow us there or follow us, Twitter, whatever, any of the social media channels, um, and we'll announce more as we, we have it. Great. Thank you. Thank you very much again for joining us in this conversation. Thank you everyone for the fantastic questions. I wish I could have done more to, to bring into the forum and hopefully we get to have many more of these coming forward. Have a lovely rest of the day, everyone. Great. Thanks, folks.